Non-Monogamy Help is a podcast where your questions about open, non-monogamous or polyamorous relationships are answered. Our host, Lola Phoenix, will consult a licensed therapist with over a decade of experience to address your problems. Names and locations have been changed or censored to keep your questions anonymous. You're listening to Non-Monogamy Help, the podcast. And welcome to episode 104 of the Non-Monogamy Help podcast. I should have said 104. Anyway, I'm Lola Phoenix. Please send your questions to ask at nonmonogamyhelp.com. You can also send it to the old Gmail account. And I'll either read them in the podcast or the column anonymously. You're more than welcome to choose which you'd prefer. If you want to read the columns and listen to the podcast and do pretty much anything else, you can go to nonmonogamyhelp.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at nonmonogamyhelp. If you want to support what I'm doing, I really appreciate it. You can become a patron. Even $1 a month helps support the daily running of the columns and the podcasts, and it just shows me a general vote of support. You can do that by going to patreon.com forward slash Lola Phoenix, and if you don't need five dollars or more a month your name with your permission will be read at the end of the podcast. I'm saying this really fast and it's causing me to mess up and I apologize. All right. Let's get to this week's discussion question. If this is your first podcast you're listening to, every week before I read the letter, I put forth a discussion question that you can use with your friends, partners, anyone else to get to know them a little bit more. I also answer it myself, hopefully briefly, to give you a little bit of context. This week's discussion question is... What scares you the most about relationships? I think this is an interesting question. And I think that generally speaking... You know, if I were to imagine, I don't even want to talk about this lady, and I think some of you know what lady I'm talking about, but there's, you know, the monster that appears and shapes itself into the thing that you're most afraid of. We shall not be discussing the person whom I'm (laughs) discussing. You know what I mean? Anyway, um... Yeah, I think whenever I thought of what that would be for me, it was always like the person that I love the most, but being, you know, violent towards me. And I think that that's always something that has scared me for a long time that, you know, somebody could pretend to be somebody else and suddenly turn violent. When I read some statistics about domestic violence and about how some, I can't remember the percentage. And to be honest, I don't want to remember the percentage, but there is a percentage of violent people that turn violent when you get pregnant. And yeah, so uh, that kind of is the thing that scares me the most is that someone could, or like you could be married to someone for a long time and you're like in your 80s and you're going through like some stuff in the attic and you happen upon Nazi paraphernalia or something like, like that's the thing that scares me, which I guess is an unlikely thing. But yeah, just the idea that the person that you are with is not who they say they are in a really, really horrible way. So yeah, uh, let me repeat the discussion question for me. What scares you the most about relationships? Let's get to this week's letter. Last March, I entered into a relationship with a wonderful person who has been non-monogamous for about two years prior to our meeting. We now consider ourselves anchor partners. Before this, I had been curious about exploring consensual non-monogamy, but my prior partners were very threatened when I brought up the subject. These relationships were not healthy, and I was controlled and manipulated by both men. My most recent ex had retroactive jealousy, obsessive compulsive disorder, and he was hyper-focused on my past sexual history. Both of my exes were anxiously attached in our relationships, and they made me push away in reaction. In my new relationship, my partner is more securely attached and does not seek to control or manipulate me. Even though our communication is very strong and we are working hard to build a trusting and secure bond, I have been struggling with what I now have come to realize is most likely quote unquote primal panic and not just jealousy and anxiety. I was rereading Polysecure the other day after my most recent meltdown when my partner had a date night and I came across the term primal panic, which perfectly described what I'm experiencing when my partner goes on dates. This is a part in the letter where the letter writer puts in what I think is an excerpt from the book Polysecure on the definition of primal panic, which I'm just going to skip because I'm worried about copyright issues, but you could probably check it out in the book. Here's the letter continuing. 
I'm a therapist and I've been trying to use somatic techniques focused on my vagus nerve to help calm myself down when my partner goes on dates. But so far, once it gets late into the night, I spiral into this hole of anxiety and panic that lasts sometimes days after the date. Logically, I know that I have consented to my partner going on the date and it is with someone who he's been seeing since before we got together, who he sees only once a month or so, but physiologically my body goes into flooded panic. Even when my partner messages me before and after his date, it does not seem to quell my panic. I have only gone on one date with another person since entering into this relationship, and while I am curious to see if going on more dates might help with my primal panic, I also do not want to use that as a crutch. I want to keep exploring non-monogamy with my partner, and my partner is incredibly supportive of me and willing to help me work through my anxiety, but I don't know how much longer I can handle the extreme emotional states that arise when he goes on dates. After having a conversation after my most recent primal panic experience, my partner said he is okay with putting other dates on pause while I work through this, but I do not want to hold him back from seeing his other partner for too long. There is not a lot of information or resources about primal panic in consensual non-monogamous relationships, and even Polysecure only mentions it once. I really appreciate your podcast and advice column, and I found your book to be very helpful, so I figured you might be a good person to ask. If you have any advice on how to deal with primal panic, it would be very much appreciated. Before we get to this week's answer, I'm going to quickly plug this episode's sponsor, BetterHelp. Quite often in a lot of my columns and podcasts, I encourage people to seek a polyamory-friendly therapist. And for a lot of people looking locally for a therapist who may be supportive or understanding or even know anything about polyamory can be impossible or out of their budget. BetterHelp allows you to find therapists online that you can send messages to at any time of the day, and they do offer some financial aid. You can get 10% off your first month by using the promo code NONMONOGAMYHELP at checkout or going to betterhelp.com forward slash NONMONOGAMYHELP. Let's get to this week's answer. Okay, first and foremost, I have like a confession to make. I really hate attachment styles, personally. And I know that they're useful for people, and it's it's not for me to tell you what's useful and what's not useful for you. Personally, my problem with attachment styles is this. I think that if you want a good encapsulation of someone who kind of, how do I put this? It's not so much that I think that they are total trash, it's just I feel like they are labels that people use for themselves that applied to situations when they were children that are no longer the case as adults. And I think that sometimes that labeling is often worse for people than it actually is helpful. Todd Baratz um, on Instagram, who is your diagnosis on Instagram, Todd Baratz is a therapist. He talks a lot about the problem with attachment styles. It's not necessarily that attachment styles in and of themselves are bad things, but I feel like people overly rely on attachment styles to the point where it becomes unhelpful. What really demonstrates why it's unhelpful for me personally, is um, the study that was done in 2011, I believe, and there may be better studies, and I totally am not a nutrition expert, so if you are and you want to say, actually, this study is bullshit, please feel free to let me know. But it was a study I read about uh, milkshakes. There was a milkshake that they gave two groups of people. For one group of people, they said that this is a 620 calorie indulgent shake. And then for the other group of people, they said this is a 140 calorie sensible shake. And what they did is after they gave these people the shake, and I think before, during, and after three times, they measured a hunger hormone called ghrelin, which is supposed to, you know, make you feel hungry. And they noticed that for the people who consumed the shake that they were told was indulgent. It was the same shake, by the way, if that wasn't already obvious. For the people who believed that they had consumed this indulgent shake, they had a dramatically steeper decline in ghrelin, the hunger hormone, after consuming the shake. Whereas if somebody thought that they consumed something that was quote unquote sensible, they had kind of a flat ghrelin response, which is very interesting. And I think that mindset is a huge deal. I think that mindset has a lot to do, if you ask any athlete, and I'm not saying I'm like a super athlete, but I do lift weights and I do strongman training. If I tell myself before a lift that I can't do it, that is not going to help me. And I would never do that. And almost any coach, any athletic anything, if you ask them, oh, should you tell yourself that you can't? No, you should not tell yourself. So what I feel like attachment theory does to some people 
is I feel like they tell themselves that they're anxiously attached. They label themselves. And what I've noticed throughout your letter is that you kind of have a very black and white way of looking at things. And, and, and I'm not saying that you're wrong about the way that you're looking at your previous relationships, but if you kind of look at it, you kind of have like, this is bad stuff. Everything was bad about this. Everything's bad then. And now you're kind of supposed to be in your good stride, right? And I think that that is painting you into a corner. Because right now, you are, first of all, you're six months into a new relationship, which is going to make anybody anxious. New relationships make people anxious for very understandable reasons. Secondly, is that you also said that your anchor partners, which in my opinion is somewhat of a hierarchy, which I'm not judging you for, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. But the thing about hierarchy is that when there is an MVP, when there is somebody who is more important in any kind of way, whether you call it a primary or an anchor partner, whatever label you call it, there is one person who is in a position that is different to others, then that means that there is one person who's in that position and that means you can be replaced. And so that is going to understandably add anxiety to everything else. I think also you are really trying to treat the symptom and not the disease. Like you're trying to logic with your anxiety. You're like, logically, I've accepted this. Logically, la la la. But you're kind of, and, and I did this as well when I had really severe anxiety, is that I tried, if I didn't try to appease the anxiety by giving it what it wants, which is kind of like what your partner is suggesting by not going on dates. And I also don't agree that that's a good idea because the more you give anxiety an inch and it takes a mile. Also, if you try and reason with your anxiety, trust me when I think I can say, and anyone who has anxiety can say, your anxiety can outreason the shit out of you. And there's a good reason for that, because your anxiety is a survival response. I don't like proposing this as anxious attachment. There's something that Todd Barat says that I really agree with, which is that adult relationships are inherently going to be insecure because it, you're not a child anymore. The reason why attachment and anxious attachment and all that other stuff was bad when you were a child is because you relied on your caregivers to keep you alive. You do not rely on your partner to keep you alive. So that attachment is going to be insecure like it is. That's just how it is. No matter how quote unquote secure it feels, Adults can and should leave relationships that don't serve them. So you are going to be anxious. And if you expect to feel quote unquote securely attached and all these sorts of good and bad black and white labels that you're putting on everything, you are adding pressure to yourself that just makes you more anxious. Your brain is trying to keep you alive. You grew up most likely, and if you haven't, then I apologize, but most of us grew up in a mo monogamous centric society. Most of us grew up in a society that has told us since we were very, very young that monogamy is the thing that you should want. It is the thing that everyone does. You don't have any kind of modeling to go on, even if you want non-monogamy. Generally speaking, it's not a very common thing to see. So you have no models, you have no cultural script for it, you're trying something completely and utterly new, and then add to the fact that you have two relationships previous to this that didn't seem to work out well. I tend to try and avoid to paint things in such black and white terms. I'm not saying that the people that you were with were great to be with or helpful, but I do think that this kind of labeling of them, you know, this like, oh, he has OCD. Oh, he's this attached. Oh, he blah, blah, blah. I don't know if that's a helpful thing. I think your brain is trying to understand this as a means to survive, but it might be helpful for you to actually challenge yourself a little bit on labeling yourself, labeling other people, making everything black and white. Like, I'm pretty sure that your partner probably does experience a lot of emotions. Maybe he just doesn't work, he or she or they just don't work them out with you. That doesn't mean that they don't have them. So you kind of labeling this as like, oh, this person is securely attached and I'm not securely attached because I have feelings. Like, I just think this is making it so much worse. And it makes total sense for you to be afraid. It makes total sense for you to be anxious. And then added to the fact that I feel like you trying to constantly ground yourself I mean, I'm not there. I don't know what's going on in your head, so it's hard for me to say. But for me, it doesn't feel like you're actually trying to be in your feelings. It's, it seems like you're trying to ground yourself away from them. It seems like you're trying to get away from the feelings, get away from them. No, I don't want these feelings. It means I'm not securely attached, blah, blah, blah. 
I, I don't feel like you're in your feelings. So you keep running from them and they keep chasing you because your brain is like, I don't know what to do. I have been told my whole life that this is how relationships are and now this is different and we've also had some bad experiences. I want to protect you from pain and that's what your brain is doing. It's trying to protect you from pain. This isn't primal panic. I mean, I don't even know enough about what primal panic is supposed to be to necessarily say whether or not it's a good definition. But I think that this is, and all of our emotions are useful information for us to have and sometimes designed to keep us safe. They don't always keep us safe because we are living very different lives now than our ancestors and the, you know, our emotions and our, the way our body responds, our physiological responses have been evolving over a long, long period and of pretty much a very different lifestyle than what we live now. It's not even about monogamy or polyamory anymore. So, you know, this is about having a completely different nervous system response and needing that nervous system response to survive. And by the way, I'm not saying that no other humans today kind of live in a life or death situation. But what I'm saying is that you have all of this inbuilt survival physiology that your body is going to remember and respond with. And of course, you're having these big panic episodes. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you have them? That makes you, you, you're trying to logic out of anxiety instead of logic into anxiety and understanding anxiety and why it's happening to you. It's happening to you because your brain is trying to keep you alive. Your brain doesn't know what the hell's going on, but it knows that its job is to keep you alive. And kind of like, obviously, the brain isn't self aware, but you know what I mean. So, yeah, I just feel like the way that you're approaching this is very kind of binary. It's very kind of, I'm going to give these things labels and these labels are very binary in a lot of ways. They're very, you're either good or you're bad. And this is a good or bad situation. My partner that I'm with now is good and I'm bad because I'm, you know, and I think that that's making things so much worse for you than it has to be. Of course, your brain's freaking out. Of course it is. You're in a big, important, securely attached relationship now with an anchor partner now. And you have a lot to lose. So of course your brain's freaking out. So I feel like maybe kind of rethink your approach to this. Rethink your approach to labeling things. Rethink your approach to yourself. Can you like step away from this kind of inclination to label and practice some acceptance of your feelings and understanding and just welcoming them in a weird way, which I know feels weird, like as a person who's had anxiety for most of their life, who pretty much like I, my anxiety is almost non-existent now. And I think a big part of that comes from the fact that I mean, I feel like I had like, to be honest, I had like an I know what you did last summer moment where I was just like, fine, come kill me then. Kill me then because I had, you know, really bad health anxiety. But I think that part of it comes from acceptance. Part of it comes from going, okay, this is my fear. I have this. Because a big part of what made my anxiety worse for so many years was seeing myself as like a Sisyphus and seeing myself as like pushing this, I'm pushing this thing, I'm always working towards never having a panic attack. That's my goal and that means success. And if I have a panic attack, that means the thing has rolling down and now I have to push it up again. That mind frame made things so much worse, so much worse. And when I just said, you know what, I have panic attacks. And that doesn't mean I'm a failure. Doesn't make me a bad person. Doesn't mean that I, I've, not, you know, I'm not managing my anxiety correctly. It's just something that's happening to me. And there are a lot of reasons why it's happening to me. Understanding nervous system response and all of that. Like there's a great account on Instagram called Repairing the Nervous System. Definitely check that out. Like understanding my anxiety through the lens of survival was really, really helpful for me. I never really related to any of the attachment stuff. So that that's just my personal perspective. Attachment theory helps people. It can be a useful tool. It's not been a very useful tool for me personally. So I would recommend maybe stepping away from that. So yeah, to sum up, I feel like I would shift my perspective here. I Away from black and white thinking, I would really think about how you label yourself, what you tell yourself about yourself. Think about the labels you're giving to both past relationships and current relationships. 
see if you can practice acceptance of your feelings and looking your fear in the face instead of just trying to like ground yourself, like push it away from yourself, like purge. You're not going to purge your emotions like a Vulcan. Like that's not going to happen. You're going to have feelings and those feelings feel really terrible, but they, you have gone through this before. You've gone through quote unquote primal panic before and you got through it just fine. And sometimes that is kind of the only thing to do. The only way out is through. But I think breaking the binary way of thinking and really think about how you're labeling things might make that worse, make what you're going through worse. Because when you're going through this panic, you're kind of, it seems like you're kind of constantly telling yourself, like, I'm insecurely attached, I'm bad, I'm this, I'm that, I'm that, you know, like, that is making it a lot worse than if you can just accept it, let it, let it go, let it have its time in the, in the sun, allow your brain to have a little bit of a, of a panic and go, oh my God, and then be there for it at the end, because you will get to the end. It will be okay, but you have to kind of go through that in order to see that after a period of time and give yourself a break. You're six months, around six months into this new relationship, and you've also had some like not so great experiences. You're trying a new relationship style, which you have absolutely no social cultural model for. Give your brain a break, man. <laughs> give yourself a break. And yeah, I think overall, if you kind of step away from a binary way of thinking, accept your anxiety, and try not to escape the feeling or reason with it, then I think that that will probably help. You may find as you go along that maybe this isn't the best thing for you for other reasons. Who knows? I can't tell you if this panic is because non-monogamy is not for you. But what I can say is that a lot of things that you're doing right now probably are contributing to it in a way that it's going to make it harder for you to realize if it's not for you if you you know if you're dealing with all this other stuff at the same time so yeah i hope that helps and good luck Thank you for listening to episode 104 of Non-Monogamy Help. If you want to be awesome, you can donate to my Patreon. Uh, I would love that. It would be really, really helpful. Like even $1 a month or whatever currency you have per month. I forget how all of that works. But anyway, that helps. And it's just like a little thing that says, oh, I support you, which is nice. And if you donate $5 or your equivalent currency more or, or more a month and you consent to it because it's not automatic by the way so if you don't want your name read on the podcast that's totally fine but if you do and you say yes then you can be here with all the other people this week's current patrons are laura boylan chris albury jones juke nikki jones james bartell leo yaki tyler tigno and justin calm if for whatever reason you can't become a patron because i absolutely understand there's a cost of living crisis it sucks that's absolutely fine. What you can do is take five minutes, log into iTunes, find the podcast, rate and review it. Also, you can apparently rate it on Spotify in some countries, but not in my country. Pfft, boo. Anyway, if you rate and review it, that would be really, really helpful to me. It just helps me get the podcast up there and some of the ratings. If you don't want to write a review, that's fine. You can just do a rating. Yeah, if you have five minutes to spare, please do that if you can. That's all for this week. You will get a new column next Friday and another podcast episode in a fortnight. Thank you again for listening. listening to Nominogamy Health. The musical was done by Chris Albury Jones at albury-jones.com. Our podcast art was done by Dom Young, and you can find Dom at dom, D-O-M, D-U-O-N-G.com. Thank you for listening.